All right, it's uh, four o'clock Berlin time, so I would say we get uh, started. Welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar. Um, before we actually get started, I would uh, do some of the housekeeping. So before we start, please use the Q&A section to post your questions and to upload your favorite questions. Um, they will be answered by one of our staff either already during the session or we will catch them up after the webinar. Then this session is being recorded and it will be uh, available at, uh, on YouTube later. And also we will send a follow up email with this presentation and with all the codes and links and uh, the downloads and so on. Um, so you don't have to scribble down anything while watching us. So where do you find the Q&A section? So I assume everyone had uh, been using Zoom in the meanwhile. So there down in the toolbar, you find this Q&A and there you can go and uh, type a question and also see what other people already asked and upload the questions that you find really useful. Some more housekeeping. So we want to do actually some polls amongst you. So um, these poll windows should automatically appear for you and then you can select the answer you want. And then you can click the submit button so it actually um, appears for us to see. And also note that all the polls are anonymous. So we will not track um, who voted and um, who answered what or who gave which answer. And with that, actually uh, the real welcome. So my name is Alice. I'm a data scientist here in the life science team of NIME. And uh, I have a background in toxicology. And with me is my colleague, uh, Daria. Hello, everyone. So I'm Daria, and I'm also a data scientist in the life sciences team. And my background is in molecular modeling. Thank you. And that already actually brings me to the first poll. So of course, we're also interested in uh, who you are and what our audience is like. So um, that should uh, hopefully come up. Yeah, there it is. Thanks. Um, so uh, what is uh, your role? We gave you some um, options to choose from. Um, you can choose multiple options. If you feel like um, there's nothing that suits for you, you can also please feel free to, to post that in the Q&A or in the chat. And uh, I already see there are some answers coming in. It's about 70% of people voted, very nice. Most of you are from academia. Oh no, actually it's quite equal. And a lot of you are data scientists. So I think we can end the poll and show the results. Very interesting. So most of you are from industry. Um, a lot of uh, chem informaticians or modelers, and um, I think the others are all data scientists. So thanks a lot. Very interesting. Thanks for sharing. And with that, I would actually get uh, really started. So um, about today, I'm going to give a quick overview about the NAM analytics platform. And then my colleague Daria is going to take over and demo today's uh, use case. And I'm going to do a the final wrap up. So that is the Anime Analytics platform. And that one is based on the graphical coding paradigm. So you're actually not really scripting or writing code, um, but you would use these little items called um, uh, Node to, to build your data workflow. And now we would actually be interested in who of you has already used NIME or knows NIME, um, is maybe even a customer, and also really interesting um, what other tools you are using. So I can see the poll is up. Again, um, please keep in mind it's anonymous, we're not tracking this, and um, click the submit button once you're done. I can see we're actually a lot of people no NIME already, very nice. Also Jupyter Notebooks is very popular. I like that, I understand that. 
So we have nearly 80% of the people voted. I think we can close it and share the results. Yeah, so um, mostly 70% of you guys know NIME already. Nice to see that. And uh, for the ones who are really completely um, beginners in NIME, and also for all the others, just to bring everyone on the same page, I would quickly share uh, five, four sentences. And uh, so what actually NIME analytics platform is. So that's a tool for data analysis, um, for data manipulation and visualization. And you can also use it to create uh, reports. And as I said already, it's based on the graphical programming paradigm. So you're using these nodes to create a workflow. And um, in addition to the core functionality, you can get a um, wide array of extensions. And these extensions would add additional functionality. So we are having, for example, extensions for text mining, for uh, network mining, obviously for chem informatics. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But you can also uh, integrate a lot of other tools like uh, Java code, R code, Python code, and uh, for example, the machine learning libraries. So we have a number of extensions available for chem informatics. And these are, I assume, the most popular ones that are open source. So obviously, we're working really closely with um, our DKIT. There is a chemistry development kit, but also the Earlwood extension, which was developed um, by Eli Lilly and is still maintained by them, or also Vernalis. Um, but we also have extensions that are run by um, some of our licensed partners. So for example, Biosolve IT, ChemAxon, Cresset, MOE uh, Schrodinger. So if you already have a license for one of these tools, you can use these NIME nodes um, as well. So just to make that clear again, all of these extensions are uh, actually um, a collection of different nodes. And when you use them, you can uh, mix and match this in NIME analytics platform with other technologies just um, as you want it. So we, um, you can attach your favorite Python script or an R script to do a visualization. Um, you can link to external data. You can go and send your data to one of these visualization tools like Tableau, Spotfire, Plotly, Power BI. Um, obviously, we have these chem informatics extensions, um, but you can also use these uh, libraries that we have integrated to do some machine learning on the data. Then the strengths of NIME. Um, one of them is uh, what's really cool is that it's uh, open source. So you can just go and download the analytics platform try it out, get started. There's no prior investment. There's no liabilities. And also once you are really working within NIME and the NIME analytics platform, it's really easy and quickly um, you can draft a, a data pipeline. You can evaluate your idea that you had on the data, if it works out or not. Um, it's really easy or um, you can easily catch uh, errors very early on. And also what's really nice is that you can check on your data with every step. So, so far I have only been talking about the NIME analytics platform, which is our open tool. So it's on the left side here. But once you have a data pipeline ready or you have your draft and you want to bring it to production, this is actually where the NIME server comes in. So the NIME server is our commercial tool. And this would um, make it easier for you to collaborate with your colleagues. And you can also, for example, access um, a workflow through REST API. And you can manage the execution, for example, um, with scheduling. If you are a customer um, and you decide you don't want to proceed with our commercial product, the NIME um, analytics platform is open source and then will always be. So in that case, you wouldn't have um, a full stop. Another really cool feature about the NIME server is um, our web portal. So that means that you can build uh, interactive dashboards and there's uh, a NIME workflow running underneath. And by that you could really 
go and connect to domain experts um, and you could facilitate uh, collaboration. And my colleague will show that in a second. So that actually brings me to the last poll where we would like to ask you what um, are the strengths of the tool that you're currently using? Again, if you find that um, your answer, you, you find the most, the coolest thing about the tool you are using is not represented here, uh, post that in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so we can see it's um, easy to assemble data pipelines is very popular. You mostly use it for data cleaning and pre-processing. And it's nearly 70% of you who voted. All right, thanks. So we can see um, most of you worship that um, it's really easy to assemble data pipelines and you're mostly using it for cleaning and data pre-processing. So nothing changed about that. Um, but also I think a community was a strong point with nearly a third of the answers. Thanks a lot. And uh, with that, I would hand over to Daria for today's demo. Thank you, Alice. I hope everyone can hear me well still. I will start sharing the screen. Okay, so I will be uh, demonstrating a use case. And our use case is um, focused on a task that is uh, um, very often tackled by molecular modelers in the pharmaceutical industry. We will be talking about predicting the bioactivity for the data set of chemicals. So an example is you are interested for example, in a biological target, and you have uh, like around 1000 molecules with the confirmed activities. And there are several things you would like to do with them. So uh, first of all, you would like to explore them interactively so that you can ideally look at them together with the medicinal chemist. And um, uh, the other thing that you would like to do is to understand whether it would be possible for you to use this um, uh, data set for uh, machine learning. So would it be possible to quickly uh, prototype and check so whether the idea works. And at the end, uh, you can, uh, you would like just to save the results so that if in some time you come back to that, you are not lost. Uh, for the data, we will be uh, work. Our data for this use case is coming from a malaria screening campaign uh, that is available as part of um, Campbell. So it was one of those deposited data set on Campbell. We are providing you the links so that you can easily access and download this data. Uh, the compounds activity uh, was evaluated against uh, five protein kinases that uh, are very important for the life cycle of the uh, malaria parasite. We will be working with a subset of this data that contains um, um, 844 compounds, and those compounds were evaluated for the activity against uh, uh, calcium-dependent protein kinase 1. So the, here is an acronym for it, uh, CDPK1. And uh, uh, the data set will look the following way. We have it here in the slide. So we have a table with the um, ST of the molecules with their identifiers, smiles, their Campbell IDs. And here in the last column, we have the activity values. And um, uh, those activities, so for 181 compounds that were inhibiting uh, the protein kinase 1 with the IC50 below 1 micromolar, uh, they will have active as their class value. The workflow that we prepared for you uh, has the following steps. So you first input your data, uh, then there is some pre-processing and defining of meta-information, and that will allow you to explore the data interactively. 
afterwards there is a quick step to select the fingerprint that you would like to use for machine learning and uh, next uh, uh, you actually build uh, four machine learning models so you use uh, four machine learning methods and afterwards you evaluate them interactively and download the report it is important for me to know uh, to show so i will be showing you the workflow on first uh, in the web portal and then in uh, nine analytics platform so when uh, all the steps that i highlighted in gray here uh, those steps of the workflow that uh, correspond to a single page in the web portal application those ones highlighted here in yellow like processing and building ones we uh, won't see them in our web portal application but i will discuss them with you while i'm going through the workflow in my analytics platform so okay with that i'm actually ready to switch to my web portal application so let me just pull it up so here it is and uh, uh, here I have the workflow that is uh, running on my local uh, NIME server. Uh, it is called ML Prototyping for Bioactivity Data. We will um, send you the links, uh, and so we will show them in the slides just after I'm finished with the demo, and you will also receive them afterwards. Um, here I have some meta information about the workflow so that I can always come back to it and understand what the workflow is doing. So I will be building model for a bioactivity data set. So let me go ahead and start running it. And now the first page of the uh, uh, is ready for me and it allows me to choose a file for the upload. So there is a file that is pre-selected for you that we prepared and we will ship it together with the workflow. If you're interested to try out the workflow for a new data set, you can go click on select file and select a file to try it on your data. I'm not gonna do it right now. I'm gonna click next. And now uh, there will be a page that helps me to define some more information. So I would like to show to uh, be able to understand in which column of my data set will have the identifiers. So these are my IDs and uh, which column contains the binary activity values. So they are in column activity. There is also another dialog here on the right uh, where I can select which uh, molecular descriptors um, I would calculate. So there is a set of six that is pre-selected uh, for this particular exercise, I would like to also select, for example, the fraction of uh, CSP3 hybridized atoms, because I would like to see how flexible the molecules are, and also the number of rings. So now I'm good to go to actually to the data exploration part. Uh, so now that will be actually the most time consuming part of the workflow and uh, what's happening underneath the hoods. So here is we have a nine workflow that runs on the server and we've seen it on the web portal. And the workflow currently is actually computing the uh, static images for each molecule. And this is, can be time consuming if you have lots of molecules and we have almost 1000. So here the computation is finished and uh, I have a web portal page so that allows me to explore my data. It has several visualization elements. So I have a parallel coordinates plot. So in this plot, each row corresponds to uh, each line in the plot corresponds to a row in my data set. And uh, each axis uh, corresponds to the computed uh, descriptor of the physchem properties. Um, next to it, so on the right, I have the violent plot, and here I have the distribution of the lipophilicity values. So this is uh, built using the plotly integration in line. I have here also um, a value filters that allows me to then on, uh, explore either active or inactive compounds in my data set. And here below, we will see the uh, um, pictures of the molecules just in a moment. So all it is important to point that all the elements uh, in this interactive view will uh, interact with each other. So for example, if I select something in one of them, uh, this selection is propagated to all the other views. So let me show you 
what does it mean? So for example, if I only want to have a look at my active compounds, so I will remove the selection of those inactive ones. And here I have my parallel coordinates plot. And I have uh, here now, here only the lines that correspond to the active compounds and the violent plot changed as well. Let me go back and select the inactive two and let us have a look actually at chemical structures. So I will explore the data set using the uh, parallel coordinates plot. So the data set is large, relatively large. So what I mean, it would be hard to look at the 1000 compounds manually and explore them one by one. It's probably possible, but you'll get tired. So I'll use the parallel coordinates plot to help me. So let me just highlight, for example, some things on it. I will move, for example, the axis with the average molecular weight next to the lipophilicity. And I will select a range here on the axis of the average molecular weight over here. So once I've selected that, um, immediately at the bottom, there are the pictures, so the tiles that uh, have the pictures of the molecules appeared. So I can go down and here I have my molecules. So there are 12 pages with them. Those ones that are in orange, they correspond to the molecules with active, who, which were determined as actives in blue as inactives. It is very interesting to point out here that for example, um, for most uh, of the molecules, so the sort of the molecular weight is uh, sort of almost linearly linked to the lipophilicity. Not always the case for this particular data set is the case, seems to be. Uh, what else can we see? about this data set. Let's have a look, for example. Oh, there is the number of rings. So I know Alice pointed me to that very nicely. So um, the molecules that contain uh, only one or two rings uh, in them, uh, they are mainly inactive. So I've selected those and uh, here I can look them through and yeah, they're all inactive. So that's also an interesting insight. So, and then if I go through like higher, then I have a mix of actives and inactives here. I can also select it here. And now if I select, for example, molecules that have only, for example, six or yeah, like very high number of rings, they will be, the majority will be actives, but maybe that's probably not so useful. And there is one more point that I wanted to show you, the topological polar surface area descriptor here, and it's linked to the lipophilicity. So if I look, for example, at highly polar molecules, so that have uh, lots of polar atoms, so we can see that they are mainly, or except one, are actives, and also they correspond to a certain uh, lipophilicity value. If I go now and slide, uh, this further down, then I have a much broader range of lipophilicity, but I also have a much broader distribution uh, of like the compounds. So I have both actives and inactives in my selection. And now if I go further and look at the compounds that have very low polar surface area, then I get more and more towards the compounds that are inactive. So I have more and more inactives in my data set. Okay. So this, I think, um, gave me quite a few insights on the data in just like less than five minutes, which I think is very, very powerful. So now what I would like to check if I can actually use this data to um, build a, a machine learning model. So I'm gonna go and click next in my application. And uh, there, is, there are a set of fingerprints that we can compute. So we are using the RT-Kit-Nime integration uh, for computing the fingerprints. Uh, it's an open camera informatics library, very powerful and supported strongly by the community. So we use it really, really a lot and uh, try to advertise it more and more. Uh, I will be using the Morgan fingerprint type, so which is the circular type of fingerprint. Uh, and um, it is a, a very good and very good and sort of proven fingerprint used in lots of benchmark uh, studies. So if something will work, this is one of the things that probably will work for the machine learning. So I will just try with that. 
on. And now I click next and there will be comp uh, machine learning uh, algorithm. So I will be building four machine learning models now and we will uh, see the performance, the performance just in a moment. So um, once again, a reminder, we are not interested in building the best model. We are interested in uh, seeing if we could use this data for machine learning in general. So, and we used four methods. Uh, so they correspond to this colorful line. So we use logistic regression, we used random forest, we used the fingerprint learner based on that bias algorithm, and we used the HGPUS machine learning library. So here I have the rock plot. So that uh, shows me the true positive uh, rate versus the false positive rate. And uh, usually uh, to evaluate the performance, you um, evaluate the area under this plot. So area under the, uh, not under the plot, area under the curve. So the AUC value and the higher this value is to one, the better is the model. However, if the value is one, you should be actually very suspicious so probably your model is overtrained. Okay, so here I have four lines, uh, four colorful lines that correspond, each line corresponds to model and I have a black line that corresponds to a random performance of the model. So here I immediately can see that for example logistic regression performed a bit worse than the others and here on the bottom corner I have also those values of the AUCs. Uh, so this is like a basic view showing me the rock plot and here I can go and have a look a bit more into detail, sort of an expert view. So first of all, I have a histogram that shows me uh, different statistics metrics, so like you see accuracy error rates and so on. And I can go and pick, for example, one of the models, let me pick random forest, it seems to have very high values of performance. And then confusion metrics appears below. And so I have in blue those uh, um, compounds that were predicted correctly, either positively or negatively, and in red those that were predicted incorrectly. So let me just click on one of them. And once I select them, then the, um, uh, they show up in the bottom in the tile view. And um, so I can also explore it a bit more into detail. And if you're interested, we can go through it during our QA. So with that, I actually basically uh, finished my workflow. So I already proved two points there. I explored the data and I um, was able to use this data for machine learning. So the last step is actually would be to have a look at the report. So this will um, take a few seconds and then we will have um, a, a report will show up in the very last, last window that gives me an overview of the model quality, of the model's quality that I built. Also have the statistics table for all those four models and some information about the details uh, about the data. Uh, and if I'm interested uh, further, I can go ahead and click on download the report. Uh, so this was actually the workflow in the web portal. So here is my report. Let me now go to Nine Analytics platform and show you what is the workflow that is running underneath the hoops uh, in the Nine server. Uh, so here is my Nine Analytics platform. So if you are uh, used to Nine, then this is the way you will see it. Uh, if you are new to Nine, so this is how are you going to see it when you open it? <laughs> Since uh, I'm, uh, what I want to, I don't want to go into details of all these windows. I would like to really focus on the workflow, so I'm going to uh, expand that window by double clicking on it. And so uh, here is uh, my workflow editor, and here is the workflow. So. Uh, as Alice already mentioned in the introduction, so in the work, the NIME is based on the graphical programming paradigm. So we are using the nodes to assemble a workflow. And so here we have several nodes. We have those ones in gray. So these are the components. Each of the components corresponds to a page on the web portal. So if I go and open the view that we generated with that component, it will look exactly the same as the view as the page on the web portal. 
So for example, here is the first one that allows me to upload the file. There are a few, um, and there are some other nodes. So for example, there is the STF reader node, and this is the one that uh, comes with the uh, nine base chemistry type uh, types and nodes extension. So with this, you can uh, read the ST file, let me open the configuration dialog. So the first step you will have uh, at the pointer, you have to point to a file you would like to read. There are some uh, more information you can specify there. Also like how you want to, how, what is the property handling and encoding there. And so once you, uh, specified that you can execute the node and then have a look at the molecules that have been read. So here is our data set of exactly 844 molecules here and a bit more information on that. Uh, so next we have a few more steps. So that was the step where we defined, uh, uh, for example, which descriptors are going to be computed. and. Uh, this is happening then in the next step. So here I have three nodes. So for the first one, I'm using to get the RTKit chemoinformatics uh, library to generate an RTKit type molecule. And then I'm gonna compute the descriptors that we selected using the RTKit descriptor calculation node. And afterwards, uh, I'm generating images using the renderer to image node. So that is easy. All of them are very easy to configure. So with the, uh, I would like to uh, look with you a bit more into detail how like this component was built. So the one uh, that we used for the exploration of the properties. So I'm gonna open it at the view once again. So here it is. It looks exactly the same as we saw it in the web portal application. So here I calculated the default properties, not the eight ones that I had, but the six ones, but I can basically um, go and have a look and explore the data exactly the same way as we did in the web portal, but now I'm not using the web portal, I'm doing it locally on my Nine Analytics platform. So now I'm going to close the view. And usually when, after you change something in the view in Nine Analytics platform, uh, and you want to close it, there is a pop-up that appears that actually says you that the view has changed and asks you whether you wanted to save this changing the changes or you want to discard them. So in this current exercise, I'm going to discard them. So those changes won't be propagated uh, further on the workflow, but um, I can also apply the settings temporarily so that for this current execution of the workflow, they will be saved or I can set them as a new default. Okay, so the next step was we chose the fingerprint and we are then using the RTKit uh, fingerprint node to calculate them. And we are to the part of building the models. So um, this is basically the last uh, unit to, to pay attention and we are almost done with the um, demo part. So here I'm building four machine learning models. So if you're familiar with um, uh, machine learning and uh, since most of you are data scientists you are you know that you have to partition the data into a training and test set and so then on training set you learn the model on the uh, test set you evaluate the prediction and in nine you do it um, using uh, learner and predictor nodes so i'm just using the annotation here so that it's a bit clearer so you have in nine then learner and the predictor nodes. And it's always like that. So we have first a logistic regression learner with which we built the logistic regression model. And then we have the predictor afterwards that would evaluate the performance of that model using the test data. Then we have, that, we have these two nodes for the random forest. We have the fingerprint Bayesian learner for, uh, we have a learner and a predictor again. And then we have uh, our XGBoost tree ensemble learner again, learner and a predictor. So, and that's basically it. We now generated four models. We have four predictors and we combine them in a single data set. So, that's it. I'm going to remove the annotation. We don't need it now. And I'm going to go back. So, now we build the models and we have now the component to actually have a look at the results. 
And at the very end, so here at the bottom, I forgot to mention that in the beginning, we have actually uh, those great notes, uh, those uh, brown notes, they correspond to the uh, revert integration. Uh, so in Nyman Analytics platform, so the one that allows you to create a report. So you can send the data, the images, whatever you want to see in the report. Okay, so now I would like to go back to my slides. So hopefully here they are. So here we have the demo of the web portal, Nyman Analytics platform. If um, you would like to access the workflow, I hope you would like to, you can find it on NimeHub. NimeHub is um, our space for collaboration and it's a great place to find the uh, example workflows, nodes, uh, components, extensions. And uh, you can search like either for a specific topic or for a functionality. And once you found what you're interested in, you can just basically drag and drop it into your analytics platform. And for example, if you have some missing extensions, then the analytics platform will ask you like, oh, do you want to install those missing extensions? So you could actually run your replication you're interested in. And so the workflow is uh, available here on Nine Hub. So here is the link. Um, the colleague of mine will post it into the chat also just now, but we will also send you the slide with all those resources. So even if you don't manage to get it, like catch it now, don't worry, it will be with you. So to download the uh, workflow, you can click here on this download icon. If you also like the workflow, you can click on this beautiful heart. Um, you can also comment on the workflow and you can deposit new versions and so on. Um, so what would be the next steps? Um, what you could do sort of as a logical step for me, uh, if I'm um, thinking about that use case, this would be actually to find uh, an, an idea to make the best model uh, and to also deploy it. And to do this, I would like to actually uh, point you to a great example of a colleague of mine. Uh, so and in this uh, example, uh, Janina shows um, a possibility how to uh, use the hyperparameter optimization in Nine to actually develop the best model and then how to uh, deploy it, how to use integrated deployment in Nine. So basically how to deploy it automatically on Nine server. And here are the links to the blog, to the videos on the YouTube. And with that, I would like to actually get back to Alice. Thank you, Daria, for this really nice demo. Let me steal back the screen. So if you want to have more information, um, you can go and check out that page. This is actually covering exactly what we showed you today. And if you want to get started with uh, NIME, we have an array of different NIME courses. So either just for the analytics platform or also for the server. And I would like to especially point out the um, introduction to working with chemical data course that Daria and me, we're going to run uh, next week. And also being an open tool means that a lot of people use it and there is a huge uh, community. So um, you can ask your questions at, and for us, this is a NIME forum. Actually, there will be also a thread for this um, webinar. So if we are not picking up your answer or not in a satisfactory way, you feel like you have more questions, you can go and uh, post in the according uh, forum thread. I think a colleague of mine posted that. And also, if you liked what you saw today, I want to point you to the nine data talks that are happening uh, in March on March 24th. And this will be in general about data science, but we're also going to have um, a life science session where we have external speakers from, for example, from the University of Vienna, who's going to talk about a computational drug repurposing pipeline using NIME for um, rare diseases and also for COVID. So feel free to join, happy to see you there. And last but not least, uh, we would like to point you to the nine books, especially to the um, beginner's luck, but also to um, from Excel to nine. And with this code, you can actually get uh, a copy of all of these book until the end of uh, April. 
And with that, we are done for today. Um, thanks a lot for joining and uh, for your time. And I think now it would be time to answer some of your questions. Um, so I saw a few questions in the chat. Um, most are, there were quite a number that were referring to where we that get, did get the data from. So this is actually from uh, this publication. I assume it was just a, a supplementary file from this publication. So we just went uh, and downloaded it from there and converted it to an SD file. So um, this is not, uh, if you just get the um, CSV, note that this will not work, you will have to convert it. And what else was there? Can I comment here? Sure, jump in. Yeah, the data set is part of the uh, malaria uh, screening campaign that was originally deposited as Campbell data set. And that was in SDF originally. But yeah, the links here we are pointing for the CSV as you just said. All right. What else did we have for questions? Um, there was another one. Um, yeah, if you could use this uh, workflow for exploring other data. So yes, we assembled this workflow, especially for this demo. But of course, like the core functionality that we show that you are calculating fingerprints, that you're exploring a data set using molecular descriptors or physical chemical properties, you can, of course, also use um, for other data sets to explore. Uh, there is a question from uh, Stefan uh, uh, Höpner, so regarding like the web scrapping. Uh, so uh, you just uh, close that. So the data, uh, you can use web scrapping to get your data into Nime Analytics platform. We haven't done it for a particular this use case. So if you're interested, we can uh, point you to the um, example workflows that we have for that. Uh, there is also a very interesting question. Uh, if if uh, the today, uh, notes and things that we show are open source or commercial. And I would like to here actually highlight uh, once again, so everything what you've seen, the workflow, uh, you can try it out in the Nime Analytics platform and all the nodes that were used, so they are open source. And uh, so if you go and download the workflow and open it in the Nime Analytics platform, so like I uh, was showing it to you, you can just go and check it. You don't need to install anything on that. So I had another question. Um, also, if you go and download this workflow, the data is already present in there. So um, I can't recall who answered that, but um, it, it is already in the workflow and you will be able to execute the workflow. What percentage of the training set did we use? I think we used 70, 30. No, Daria, you used 80, 20. 80, I was 30. just clicking on like answer that question live yeah, and you were first. <laughs> <laughs> the default settings are 70, 30 though on the note. That um, like when we built the workflow, uh, we use 80, 20. It just, I like to use 8020. It's, it doesn't have to be that way. Then we also have a question. Uh, do we have any webinars coming up for the life sciences? So um, yeah, as I said already in the data talks, we're gonna have a, a life science session, but also in April, we're actually gonna have uh, data talks that are dedicated just to the life sciences, where we will cover um, topics from cheminformatics, bioinformatics. Ah, no, it's lab data. Sorry, excuse me. It's just about um, the lab data. So we will touch upon FAIR and uh, see the SILA integration and I think the NRI data. Uh, so there are a few questions I'm just trying to answer. So first of them, the first one was, um, what about the polymers? 
I have never tried using that approach for the polymers and uh, I'm um, pretty sure that particularly that approach won't work. Um, unfortunately, I don't have experience using the polymer modeling, so uh, I cannot uh, give you a proper answer, but um, if you're really interested, I'm happy to follow up on that. There was also a question regarding the deep learning and NLP integrations in NIME. So there are integrations in NIME. Uh, you're also asking about um, NLP integration based on SMILE. So maybe you are referring to a particular uh, publication where um, the SMILEs were used uh, for like natural language processing. Uh, so if you were using, for example, the uh, Python for building the model for the NLP, you can easily integrate that in NIME. There's also a question um, if we need a, a defined programming language to use it. No. If you don't want to code and or script in NIME, you don't have to. So there is a very, very tricky question from Bukra Iltis. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. So about the performance expectations for running certain steps. I'm not sure if that's like um, related to this particular workflow or in general to the uh, workflow performance. So of course, if you have like, the performance will depend not only, will depend not only on the size of your data set, but also on the, uh, processing steps that you have and, and like the computation uh, that you're trying to perform for it and NIME is uh, very good in utilizing them so um, if you're using NIME analytics platform it will basically run in your RAM so whatever can fit in your RAM that will be your beside your resources if you are running the NIME server, so then there is a possibility of running, for example, distributed executors, or you can also deploy your um, application, for example, one of the infrastructures on, on AWS, so you're really not limited in the resources. So I think once you get into the point that you're working with a huge data set and you see that your local machine cannot handle that, I mean, and then you can go to use the server for the resources. However, I think uh, the points and the advantages of the server are also in like great possibility to um, collaborate and to deploy models and not only utilizing the resources. I hope I was able to answer your question. I think in the same direction goes the question if we can integrate data from uh, AWS S3. We can. Yeah, for if you're interested in uh, those things, so there we have a big data course and there there are examples that also cover that. And I think we have a few blocks for that. Um, we were asked if we could give some of the examples of workflows for beginners. Um, again, I would point you to the NIME Hub. Um, you find, for example, also all the workflows that are in the book there. Um, all kind of workflows. So if you just want to get started, I would advise you go to the NIME hub and uh, just look around their example workflows for, for kind of everything, beginner level, expert level, whatever you desire. There is a very interesting question about applying NIME in the GXP environment and compliant environment. Uh, I love this question because um, uh, it is being applied uh, in that environment as well. So that's why it is possible. I, if you're interested, uh, shoot us a message and we can talk about it more. And there is also one more question about compatibility with Mac OS Big Sur. I run this beautiful Big Sur and it seems to work. I also have my um, local name server on that, so it's compatible. 
All right, I think we're mostly done. And uh, thanks again, guys, for joining us on the session. And uh, hopefully see you next week in the chemistry training.